Namaste, everyone. Thank you for joining us for a session of Veda, uh, Veda Sampada. So these sessions will focus on Veda mantras and knowledge systems based on the Vedas. And our first session of uh, Veda Sampada is going to be uh, hosted by Purnima Mysore. So Purnima is a yoga teacher who is working to bring the wisdom of yoga into everyday living for herself and for her students. Her yoga journey started in early 2003 through asana and an introduction to uh, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. And she continues to study and learn while she teaches. She blogs about her observations and teaches personalized sessions both online and in person. She is also a student of Veda recitation and learns Veda mantras in the Mysore and Sringeri tradition from her teacher Shantala Sri Ramaya ji, who is the founder of Veda Studies. She is, um, and in today's uh, session, Purnima will explore the dance of sound and silence in Veda mantras. So let's all in, um, in um, welcome Purnima to join us for this session. Purnima, would you like to join us, please? Namaste, Purnima. Namaste, Sophie ji. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for joining Indica Yoga for this lovely session on Veda Sampada. Your session is going to be the first in the series of sessions. So thank you so much. And we really look forward to understanding this dance of sound and silence. Wonderful. Great. Thank you so much for this opportunity and for, for this platform. It, it's absolutely amazing to be doing this with you. Thank you so much for your kind words. So I'm going to hand over the session to you now and I'll see all of you towards the end when we will open for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia Ji. And welcome everyone. And thank you so much for being here. Uh, so like Sophia Ji said, we uh, are going to be looking at uh, the aspect of sound and the absence of sound today uh, in this session for the next about 45 to 50 minutes we are going to be exploring this and so this is what we're going to be looking at for the next um, 50 minutes or so and this has been my exploration my personal journey through the last many years with yoga and then through chanting and uh, what we are going to be doing is we are going to be talking about a few concepts from both yoga and veda and then we're going to look at how these two come together let me start off with gratitude to all my teachers I learned from. Uh, the entire Mysore Sampradaya, the Mysore tradition in which I learn all my chanting, uh, specifically Guruji M.S. Srinivasan of the Chalakere brothers and his student Shantala Sri Ramaya, who is my uh, primary teacher. Uh, through Veda Sari, she teaches chanting and uh, she has been doing such an amazing job with um, emanating with you know sharing this knowledge of um, Veda chanting and how to how to do it in a way that is traditional in the Guru Shishya Parampara and I feel very lucky to have found her. Most of my yoga education has been at the Yoga Institute. And I'm very thankful to them for showing me an aspect of yoga where it is simplified enough to follow for householders like you and me. At the same time, it still retains the essence of what yoga is about. And I'm thankful to everybody in my life who's come into my life, who's taught me some amazing life lessons who's helped me understand uh, what yoga is talking about in its texts. And for this, I'm eternally grateful to every single person who has come into my life, who still continues to be here, uh, who was maybe here for a little while. They've all, everybody has contributed in some way to my journey. And I'm really thankful for that. 
we will go straight to invocation mantras now. So if you are familiar with these mantras, you can join me. If not, you can simply close your eyes and you can listen in to these mantras. These are mostly Veda, Veda mantras. Along with that, I will also be doing a small little chant um, that I usually do in all of my yoga classes. श्री गुरुभ्यो नम हरि ओं गणना गणपति हवामहे कविंकवीना मुपम्रवस्तम ज्येष्ठराज ब्रह्मण ब्रह्मणस्पत आनसीदन महागणपत नम प्रणो देवी सरस्वती वाजे भिर्वाजिनी वती धीनाम वित्रियवतु आनो दिवो बृहत पर्वता सरस्वती अजता गंतु यज्ञ हवन देवी जुजुषाण घृता ची षग्माच मुशती शृणोत वाग्देव्य नम चरण पवित्र वितत पुराण ये नूतस्तरति दुष्कृता तेन पवित्रेण शुद्धेन पूता अति पापमरातीसद्गुचरणारविंदाभ्या नम ओ सहनावतु सहनौ भुनक्त सह वीरवाह तेजस्वीतमस्तु मिद्विषा वह ओं शाति 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 ओ योगेन चित्तस्य पदे न वाचाम मल शरीर से च वैद्यक योपाकोत्तम प्रवर मुनीना पतंजलि प्राजलिरान तोस्मी These mantras are even more special chanting them today in this session with all of you um because it is guru purnima today and uh i it just makes this session extra special for me and uh so yeah extra extra gratitude for indica for this very special um day as well you have definitely made this day a lot more special All right, we will dive right in to what we are discussing today. So we'll start off with just a quick little look at what is my understanding of what yoga is all about, and the main texts that I look at in my studies. So what is yoga? Yoga can be so many things. You might have heard a lot of definitions. You might have heard people saying what yoga is to them. and the beauty of yoga is that all of this is true and all of this is yoga because yoga is what we interpret it to be in our life what that means is yoga is a huge body of work that encompasses every single aspect of life and where we look at yoga is based on our perspective of life based on our life experiences and based on what we need at that moment of time in our life and that's what we adapt from this vast umbrella of work that comprises yoga and we take what we need and we use that and that is why you will hear such vastly different things about what yoga is yoga for me has been a way of life what that means is 
doing it in various ways, implementing it in my life in various ways, uh, be it uh, a physical practice, where it is asanas and pranayama and kriyas, which is cleansing techniques, physical practices, studying the, the scriptures, studying various um, works and commentaries about yoga, but also looking at how all of this is applicable. And that I think for me has the biggest, has been the biggest aspect of it. What does all of this mean to me in my life as a householder, as someone who lives in society, as someone who is not an aesthetic? And how does this then apply to me? Because a lot of these concepts often tend to be um, interpreted from the perspective of living away from society and it can be beautifully interpreted to actually blend in with life as we know it today. And which is why it is also a way of learning experientially. When your yoga teacher tells you something, you do not need to accept it at face value, right? When someone says that, oh, this might be good for you, the idea is you try it out. They're giving you a suggestion, you try it out you see what that feels like for you in your life, in your context, if that makes sense to you. And a lot of times it will, and a lot of times it will not. And then you make an informed choice about what aspects of yoga you bring into your life and what aspects are not really working for you right now. And they can be part of your experience. They can be part of what you know about yoga but you needn't bring them into your life right away. But maybe later on at another different time, point of time in life, you will be able to do it. And that for me, I think is a really beautiful way of um, interacting with this beautiful philosophy. And end of it, what we are looking at is to live in a way where we are healthier and happier, and we are trying to live life in a better way. These are the three main texts that I refer to, that I follow, uh, that I study. The main one is uh, Sage Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. This was the very first text that I was introduced to when I started studying yoga. And uh, it has been something that I have been studying since then. It has been something that gives me, that reveals something new to me, even today, even after almost two decades of um, sitting with this scripture and studying it in small bits. It's the same with the Bhagavad Gita. Every time I look at it, it reveals something new, something interesting, some a new perspective, a new aspect of what, um, what is talking about and how it is relevant to my context in that given time. And Sankhya Karika actually gives a very good foundation to the, the practice of yoga. Sankhya is a philosophy that goes, is very complementary to yoga. For those who are not familiar, these are pairs of philosophies that go very well together. So how it goes is that Sankhya gives us um, definitions and explanations of what various terms and concepts mean. And then when we look at um, the Yoga Sutras and many other texts, we then get the tools of how do we use these concepts and bring them into our life. We get tools to apply these concepts, apply this knowledge into our life in various ways. So Sankhya is a very good way to build a solid foundation for a consistent and fulfilling yoga practice. Now, we're going to just look at a few uh, yoga relevant for what we're discussing today. The first one that we're looking at is Abhyasa and Vairagya. Now, these are two different concepts. However, uh, we do talk about them together for a reason. And uh, in the Yoga Sutras, these are uh, talked about together. And again, there's a very strong reason for it. 
when we talk about abhyasa abhyasa means practice and consistent practice now when we say practice often we think of it as a physical practice right getting on the mat doing your asanas doing your physical practice doing your pranayama that is one aspect of it but when we say consistent practice it needn't only mean asana practice it could mean any yogic practices that you're doing any yogic practices that you've been trying to bring into your life and make a part of your life and your routine being consistent with that practice day in and day out not um not forgetting about the practice um doing it sometimes not being regular with it that breaking that cycle of inconsistency making it consistent being regular showing up for yourself is what abhyasa is about now often when we are talking about abhyasa it ends up being very goal oriented and the being very result oriented in the way we look at it today especially and what happens then is a lot of times with yoga the results are not immediately apparent sometimes results can take years to show up sometimes the results show up in ways that um are unexpected they show up in ways that are different from how we envision and this can many a times be demotivating to people and they let go of that consistency and so which is where it is paired with vairagya for that specific reason when we hear the word vairagya it often seems to conjure up images of people leaving society leaving family going off to the forest going off to the himalayas things like that but it needn't mean that it could mean that in a very specific context but for us as householders what vairagya means is so vairagya is detachment right but when we think of it from our perspective of being householders what we are looking at is to be a little detached from the results of our practice of our actions we do our actions but then we have no control over the results that it will bring sometimes it will bring the results that we envision sometimes not sometimes it will happen immediately sometimes not and so the idea is that's where we develop vairagya we do not get demotivated by these things we do not get demotivated when we do not see immediate results when the results don't go as per plan or something happens we have setbacks things like that what we choose to focus on is the consistent practice is the abhyasa that should be our focus and that is what this concept talks about the next one that we talk about is santosha this is maybe something you're familiar with if you have studied the yamas and niyamas this is the second niyama that sage patanjali talks about in the yoga sutra so most of these concepts i'm talking about are from the yoga sutras uh, santosha is mentioned in chapter 2 abhyasa vairagya is mentioned in chapter 1 and santosha is often interpreted as happiness but i think a more accurate way of uh, describing it is contentment and this is again a consistent practice of being content and a big part of contentment comes from acceptance what do we mean here what we are talking about is um to be content we have to accept the fact of life right who we are what we are where we are in life has to be accepted for us to feel content in this moment right we are talking about a consistent practice of contentment we are not talking about getting to a point where we are content but being content where we are right now right and that requires acceptance acceptance that this is what it is at this moment it doesn't mean that this cannot change this fact this reality cannot change because it is always changing but what it means is right now this is what it is and i accept that this is what it is and then 
I look at, okay, what can I do now? What can I do now to make myself better, to make my life better, to go ahead on my journey, right? And why this is so important, why the contentment and acceptance is so important is if you're working towards something and if today this moment is your starting point for it you could start from one of two places you could start from i hate how i look i hate the person that i am i hate what my life is right now i am a failure blah blah you know we look at it from that perspective we hate who we are what we are where we are and that becomes our starting point to work towards a goal so that we can love who we are, where we are. That's one way of looking at it. The other way that we are looking at it is saying, this is who I am, this is where I am, this is my starting point. I'm okay with this, but I know that things can be better. I know that I can be better. And so how do I work towards that? And I make a plan for myself and I start working on it. So that becomes my starting point. And this second way of looking at things is what we're talking about in Santosha, where we are not wasting energy on negativity, where we're not wasting energy punishing ourselves and berating ourselves, but we are accepting the situation so that we're no longer thinking about that constantly, but then we are looking at next steps. We are focusing on what we can do rather than what is. So that's where Santosha comes in. And this consistency that we talk about in Santosha again goes back to Abhyasa, right? So if you can see that all of these are again connected, right? When we say that we let go of any kind of resentment that we may have towards ourselves or others because of what life looks like, that is Vairagya, right? The last one, which is again, extremely relevant to what we're doing today is Mauna. Mauna means quiet or silence. And we talk about physical and mental silence. And this is a big theme in both yoga and Veda. Mauna, the practice of Mauna often starts with people saying that I will not speak for a certain period of time every day, every week, every month. But the idea of it is to go from physically not speaking to then working on quietening the mind during that time that we are not speaking out loud. That is the practice of Mauna. Now here again, Abhyasa, extremely important. We have to be consistent with this practice for it to go from physical to a mental practice. If we do it only once in a while, it is very, very difficult to work towards it. The other thing is we have an attachment towards communication, more and more so now because um, we are in the social media age and we are urged to be constantly connected, to constantly interact and communicate. And to then draw back from that takes a little bit of letting go and saying, okay, whatever is happening there, I'm okay with not being interactive, not being present there for a little period of time, and I'm okay with doing that, right? I'm content with just staying here in my own space with myself for a little time, and then I will go back to it. But for now, I'm taking the space for myself. And this is, this is the practice of Mauna, to bring silence into our day, into our being. And it can start off in very small bits. People start off with as little as a minute, two minutes, five minutes, and build up from there. Because for many of us, this can be quite an uncomfortable process, right? The physically not speaking can itself be quite uncomfortable, but then to say that, okay, I'm not gonna look at, um, I'm not gonna look at social media. I'm not gonna talk to people. I'm not gonna think about things is a whole different aspect of the practice, which takes a lot of consistency, which does take effort, but it's a very rewarding process to go through. 
So these are the three yogic concepts that we are mainly considering today. Now let's go on to the Veda side of things. This was about a little bit about yoga. Veda Patanam. Patanam is a Sanskrit word. It's a Sanskrit word that simply means study. So this simply means the study of yoga, uh, study of Veda, sorry. So Veda Patanam is the recitation of Veda mantras, mantras from the four core Vedic texts, which is the Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Sama Veda, and Atharva Veda, right? There are four big bodies of text, and these four are considered Veda. There are many other texts that have come through a lot of knowledge that is in these four texts, a lot of referencing to these texts that have been born from parts of the knowledge that are in these texts. And those are called Vedic texts. So the Bhagavad Gita, a lot of other uh, Puranas and Darshanas are considered Vedic texts. But when we talk about Veda, we talk about these four core texts. And within the lineage that I study in, which is the Mysore Sampradaya, the main text that we look at is the Krishna Yajurveda. Krishna Yajurveda is one recension, one branch of uh, Yajurveda. There are two main branches that exist as of today, Shukla and Krishna Yajurveda. We mainly study the Krishna Yajurveda. So um, this is something that I know I was confused about before I started learning chanting um, because popular culture exposes us to a very different kind of chanting. And so chanting is very, very different from singing. Different in that we do not get to change the tune. We do not change how the rhythm is, how the tone of a mantra is. These things are given in Vedic text and we follow them exactly as they are given. And the idea behind doing that is to maintain and pass on the knowledge that is contained in the Vedas as perfectly as possible. They have been maintained and kept alive for centuries through this exact process by chanting them in the exact way that they are written in these texts. And so that is what we strive to do. And the moment we start learning Vedas, the moment we start learning chanting, whether we are teaching it or not, we become a key link in preserving these texts, in preserving this knowledge. And what we should strive towards is to do that job as perfectly as we are able to do. Now we're going to look at, just quickly look at a few rules that we follow when we are chanting. The first one we look at is Varna. Varna is the pronunciation of syllables. So each syllable in Sanskrit has a very unique, specific sound. And so varna, right? Two syllables, they have a very specific sound. It's not a na, it's a na, right? So there are small little differences. And the more we stay true to these pronunciations, the clearer our recitation is, the clearer our chanting is, and the more powerful it sounds. So one is to learn these pronunciations as accurately as possible. That's the first one. Then we talk about para, intonation. What I mentioned in the earlier slide, that we pay attention to very specific notes that are, and these are given in proper Vedic texts. So you look at a, a good Vedic text, it will always have markings of swaras. It will have markings of everything that you need to do when you're chanting that particular mantra or set of mantras. And swara is something that is very, very unique to Veda. It is part of the Vedic Sanskrit language. If we remove this part, it is no longer Vedic Sanskrit. It is Sanskrit, but it is not Vedic Sanskrit. Vedic Sanskrit 
in its nature contain for us, contain intonation. The next one is matra. Matra is the length of syllables. So there are short syllables and there are long syllables. So if you look at the words here itself, sva, ra, short little syllables, they're not lengthening anything. But you look at the word matra, both are long syllables. We take a little more time. So ma takes more time than sva to pronounce. So this is what we're talking about in matra, the length of syllables. So the more we stick to this, the clearer our chanting becomes. And it becomes very clear to anybody listening exactly which syllable we are pronouncing and how we are pronouncing it. Next comes balam. Balam is the emphasis that we place on each syllable, right? So there are mellow sounds and there are strong aspirated sounds. So most of the uh, words that you see here, the Sanskrit words that are on screen right now are the softer words, right? We are not putting a lot of energy and force into pronouncing these words, these syllables, balam, swara, matra, they're mellow. Whereas you have words, um, like the earlier slide had the word patanam. When you hear me pronouncing that, the th has a bit of force in it. I am, it's almost as if I'm letting out a little breath to bring that force behind that syllable. So that is an aspirated sound, right? So we have alpa pranas, which are the mellow sounds, maha pranas, which are the aspirated sounds. Then we have Sama. Sama simply means a sense of uniformity, continuity when we are chanting. So when you heard me chanting the invocation mantras, from start to finish, they were at the same pace. I didn't suddenly speed up or slow down. I did not suddenly go very high or very low. My pitch was uniform throughout. Correct? And there's also a certain rhythm to it. So maintaining that rhythm, maintaining some sense of uniformity, because that is very soothing to listen to. It's very easy to pay attention to it. It doesn't distract from what is being chanted. And it can become quite meditative when you're listening into somebody chanting. Last one is Santanaha. Santanaha is punctuation and conjugation. Where do we pause? Where do we have a clean break in chanting? Where do we breathe? Where do we combine um, words and syllables? How are these words and syllables combined? What happens when certain syllables are combined? Right? All of these rules are given to us in the Veda itself. And the more we follow these rules, again, all of this brings clarity to our chanting. No matter who is listening, that person may or may not be familiar with what you're chanting, but they will be able to hear clearly exactly what you're chanting, how you're chanting it. And it makes for very good listening, right? And if you are, if you would like to teach, chanting all of this becomes extremely important because it makes you an effective teacher you are able to teach in a way that's very clear to your students now let's look at some parallels between yoga and veda right what what are these little common threads that i've been able to notice as i practice these two the first one was concentration and one-pointed focus. All of yoga is geared towards this. All of yoga is geared towards getting us to a point where we are not distracted by what is outside, but also what is within us. Having an undistracted, unwavering mind is something that yoga, all yogic practices aim for. That is the practice of yoga right? Building this focus, building this concentration, be it an asana practice, be it pranayama, be it any other kind of meditative practices that you do within yoga, everything is geared towards 
one pointed focus. And with Veda, unless you have some level of focus and concentration, it is almost impossible to learn and chant mantras accurately. Because there are so many little details that we have to pay attention to, so many little things that we have to keep in mind when we are chanting, that it becomes very, very important to have this focus. And the wonderful thing is, even if you start off with just a very low level of focus, you're still someone who's very distracted. As you keep chanting Veda Mantras, they can help you build focus. There are a lot of practices within Veda which help you build focus. And one such practice, which is very widely used by a lot of people, is Japa. Japa is you take a small little mantra and you repeat it over and over and over again right tens of times hundreds of times keep repeating it keep repeating it and it builds a lot of focus because you're focusing on the same thing over and over again the next thing is steadiness steadiness in the body steadiness in the breath steadiness in the mind right and all of this is something that's I think quite obvious in yoga, but in Veda, this may be something a lot more subtle. In yoga, when we're doing asanas, if we feel wobbly, if we feel imbalanced, it's very difficult to do asanas. So the first aspect of that, of bodily steadiness in yoga comes from when we're doing asana practice, building the strength, building the balance to bring stability and steadiness into the body, right? What this does is it helps us then get into meditative practices like chanting and sit without being wobbly, without being imbalanced, without being uncomfortable in our bodies. We are able to sit with our back straight without the back hurting. We are able to sit without the legs going numb or without having to constantly move and be distracted. That is the idea of steadiness in the body. In the breath, if you're not able to breathe well, especially during physical yogic practices, it becomes quite difficult to then do those practices because then you're out of breath, you're tired, you're exhausting yourself. The same thing with Veda, if you're chanting, especially if you're doing a loud practice, you cannot do it unless you have some amount of control on the breath. And this breath control builds as you practice, but you have to start with some amount of steadiness, and then you build from there, right? So that is the steadiness of breath. And steadiness of mind goes back to the earlier point of concentration and one-pointed focus, building that, working towards that steady focus. The next one is inner stillness. As you can see, all of these are very, very closely interconnected. When we are talking about stillness, a lot of times we may not find quiet, serene spaces around us for our practices, whatever those practices may be, right? Meditative practices, any kind of physical yoga practices, chanting practices, any other practices where you need peace and quiet, it may not always be possible to find that, right? I live in an extremely busy, extremely crowded Indian city. And so for me, it's next to impossible to find that, to find that, uh, that quietitude, to find that space of when there's nobody around, when there's no noise around, it's next to impossible for me to do that. But then what do we do? Do we not do these practices? No, what we do is we find that stillness within us. We try to build and bring that stillness within us. How do we do that? By practicing steadiness, by practicing focus, and bringing some amount of control and management over the mind, where we are able to say that, okay, outside there's all of this going on, but I'm going to try and steady my mind to a point where I can sit still, my mind is not distracting me too much, and I'm able to focus on whatever it is that I need to do, 
it may be some task at work it may be a practice that you need to do it could be anything at all but all of these are things that are as applicable to these specific practices as they are to our daily life whatever we are doing if we do it with full concentration with while being fully present by feeling very stable and balanced it will make us more effective it will make us more efficient it will get the job done in the best way possible we will be able to give our best every single time and that is our goal the last thing we're looking at is silence the point of all yogic practice that we do be it physical or otherwise we are looking at bringing stillness and silence within us we may be in the most chaotic place possible we may be in the most chaotic life situation possible to be able to maintain equanimity to be able to still ourselves for a moment so that we are able to breathe properly we are able to think straight and function to the best of our ability and when it comes to veda chanting we do the exact same thing we practice and practice and practice to a point where the focus and concentration becomes so very much a part of us becomes so very much ingrained within us that we don't need to chant out loud that we feel like being silent we feel like just being in this silence and enjoying this silence that we've built within us not being distracted by anything that's happening around us now after this i'm going to make you all do just a very simple little practice just to experience what it is that we're talking about before we go to that i just wanted to give you all a minute to think about what we have spoken about in yoga and veda and if you learn yoga or if you learn chanting of any kind just think about it if you want you can note something down that you think of i want you to just look at are any of these things things that you have experienced you may have experienced it in these practices you may have experienced it when you're engaging in a hobby you may have experienced this maybe at work maybe at home anything at all but i want you to think about these four things that are on your screen right now if you've had any personal experience with it yourself right so just take a minute and think about it and see if this kind of makes sense to you in your context in your life Because a lot of us have had these experiences, but we sometimes may not have realized that that is what it was. All right, let's move forward. And this is this is a process. This this thinking about these things is something that you can continue to do afterwards as well. Just to examine for yourself if you're curious about have I experienced this? You can continue to examine these things and see what you find. So we are gonna look at just a few minutes of doing a couple of different things just to see if we can maybe see a glimpse of all of this that I've been talking about for um, the last 40 minutes or so. And just to look at, is this something that's very complicated? Is this something that um, takes a lot of effort or is this something that we can quickly see maybe just a little bit as we go through this little practice? So we're going to be looking at four small little things. We're going to look at movement. We're going to look at the breath. 
a little sound and a little silence. Okay, so these four things we are going to look at. So, if uh, you are lying down, if you're feeling unwell and you have logged into the session, don't worry about it. You can just watch the movement part of it and join me in the rest of it. If you wish to just watch, not do this practice, perfectly all right as well. Okay, but if you're sitting up, if you're able to join in just a little bit of movement, we're not doing any asanas, but just wherever you are, if you're able to, Sit a little away from back support, sit straight and see what that feels like. If it feels like a lot of effort for the back, if the back is hurting, if the back feels comfortable, the neck and shoulders, are they able to relax? And let's interlock our fingers. Take them above the head, turn the palms up and stretch. And as we stretch, we take a nice big breath, inhale, and we stretch the arms up. Stretching up, up, up. And then we exhale there itself. And as we inhale again, we stretch up a bit more. And again, a big breath in. And exhale. One last time. Again, stretching up a bit more towards the ceiling, towards the sky and inhale. And as you exhale, bring the arms down. Move the back around a little, maybe twist a little where you are. Move around a little, open up the back. Maybe there's a little bit of stiffness. You've been sitting all day, maybe at work. Move it around, arch the back a little. Bend it side to side. And see what happens when you bring in a little movement. Make the shoulders a little. Maybe rotate the neck a couple of times. Release any tension that may build up in the neck. And now just observe the body and see if that little bit of movement did something. Did something to make you maybe a tiny bit more alert. Maybe woke you up a little if you've just woken up. Maybe it opened up a little bit of the stiffness in the back. Maybe it made you just a bit more comfortable in where you are. Examine these things. And then you can sit back again, take back support if you want and sit comfortably. Try to keep the back straight if possible. If you're lying down, continue to lie down. If all right, you don't have to sit up. Be comfortable wherever you are. Do not be in pain. Do not be in discomfort. And now gently close your eyes if that's possible and comfortable. And let's take a slow, long breath in through the nose. And gently exhale it out. Again, in through the nose. And back out through the nose. Now the next two times we inhale in through the nose. And then blow it out of the mouth as if you're blowing out a candle nice and slow. Again, in through the nose. And now breathe normally and just see what your breath feels like. To see if breathing feels like a lot of effort or breathing feels very easy. Are you taking quick short breaths? Are you taking big slow breaths? All of it is okay. Just become aware of what's happening. And now 
I'm going to do a little bit of chanting. So I'm going to chant the Gayatri Mantra. I'm going to chant it three times. I'm going to do it a little slowly. If you know the mantra the correct way, you can join me. If not, just listen. Listen to how the mantra goes up and down. Notice the rhythm. Notice where I'm breathing. Notice as many details about it as you can. Om Bhur Bhuvasovaha Tatsa Vitur Bare Enyam Bhargo Devasya Dhimahi Dio Yona Prachodaya At Om Bhur Bhuvasovaha Tatsa Vitur Bare Enyam Bhargo Devasya Dhimahi Dio Yona Prachodaya at Om Bhur Bhuvasovaha Tatsa Vitur Pare in Yam Bharko Devasya Dhimahi Dio Yona Prachodaya at I'm going to chant it three more times and this time I'll speed it up a little. And just see what it feels like now. If it sounds and feels any different from when I was chanting it slowly. <clears throat> Om Bhur Bhuvasovaha Tatsa Vitur Pare Enyam Bhargo Devasya Dhimahi Dio Yona Prachodaya At Om Bhur Bhuvasovaha Tatsa Vitur Pare in Yam Bhargo Devasya Dhimahi Dio Yona Prachodaya At Om Bhur Bhuvasovaha Tatsa Vitur Pare in Yam Bhargo Devasya Dhimahi Dio Yona Prachodaya At Sit in silence and just see if you can feel the effects of this. Maybe you can still hear the chant a little bit in your mind. Stay with it. And now I will leave you with a slightly longer chant. This one is a suktam. A suktam is a hymn. It's called the Medha Suktam. And this suktam is a prayer to give us good concentration, to give us good memory, and to give us good retention power so that we can stay focused on whatever it is that we are focusing on and we can continue to focus on it. We can continue to remember this is what we are focusing on. Retain all our attention and concentration on that idea, on that particular thing that we are focusing on and to stay there. So this little hymn is praying for that. So you can listen in. Again, notice as many things as you can about the chant. See what it feels like when you listen to it. Om Medha Devi Jushamana Na Aga At Vishwachi Bhadra Sumanasyamana Vaya Jushta Nudamana Durukta An Brihadva Dema Vidathe Suvira Aha Vaya Jushta Rishir Bhavati Devitvaya Brahma Gatashri Rutatvaya Aha Vaya Jushta Shchitram Vindateva Susano Jushat Vadravino Namedhe Medham Mahindro Dadatu Medhan Devi Saraswati Medham Me Ashvina Vubhava Dhattam Pushkarasraja Aptara Suchaya Medha Gandharve Suchayan Manaha Daivi im medha saraswati sama am medha surabhe jushatagasvaha. 
आमा आम मेधा सुरभे विश्वरूपा हिरण्य वर्णा जगती जगम्या ऊर्जस्वती पयसा पिन्वमाना सामा आम मेधा सुप्रती काजुषंता मयि मेधा मयि प्रजा मयि अग्निस्तेजो दधा तो मयि मेधा मयि प्रजा मयि इंद्र इंद्रिय दधा तो मयि मेधा मयि प्रजा मयि सूर्यो भ्राजो दधा तो ओम शांति 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 ही साइलेंस I will end with a short closing mantra. Om Pur Namadav Pur Namidam Pur Nath Pur Namudachyate Pur Nasya Pur Namadaya Pur Nameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Hi Thank you so much, everybody, for joining in um, for the entire session. And uh, hopefully, uh, this was something that was interesting, maybe something that um, was new, maybe a little different to what uh, you know about yoga or Veda. And, uh, yeah, I hope you had a good time in the session. Uh, good to Purnima wishes to everybody again. It's a very special day and I am so very happy to be here doing this on this day. So thank you so much to Indika Yoga and thank you so much for this platform that they provide. So, so much gratitude. And thank you so much, Sophia G, for hosting these sessions. Thank you so much, Purnima. Namaste again. That was really, really informative and in-depth. Thank you for that beautiful session and for all the work you put into it. And it was so lovely to hear you recite the Veda. I mean, that's always a beautiful sound and you have such a beautiful voice. Lucky you, so blessed. Um, thank, you. thank you. And I'm sure everyone's feeling as calm and light as I am. So we're open for questions now and we already have four. So let's get straight into it. First question is from Preeti Pandya Ji, who's asking if we get a recording for this and each word here is a gem and how to study this further. I will answer the first part of that question, Preeti Ji. All of our sessions are recorded and they will be available on our YouTube channel, on the Indica Yoga YouTube channel, as well as the Indica Yoga Facebook page and all of our social media. So you can come back and visit this recording, not just you, but anyone who's watching. You can revisit the recording. You can share the recording. And how do I study this further? Um, well, Purnima will answer that. Uh, so studying it further, uh, the best way to study any kind of philosophical text is find a teacher. Uh, you can look at books, you can study books, you can study commentaries, but unless you have a teacher to guide you through them, to guide you through what is being spoken about, who can guide you through, uh, you know, breaking certain things down and making sense of them, uh, only a teacher can do that for you. So where can you find a teacher that has to be a personal journey? <laughs> uh, many of us, I mean, it took me a very long time to find my teachers. Um, and I keep looking for more people to learn from. And so keep looking. And in the meantime, keep practicing, keep uh, studying what you can. 
and you will be able to find the right teachers for you who will be able to help you make sense of it. Thank you so much. Um, I hope that answers your question, uh, Preeti Ji. Then we have someone, an anonymous attendee who actually attends all of our sessions. So thank you. Uh, good to see you here again. The, it's not really a question, but out of curiosity, you mentioned about Abhyasa not breaking the cycle and showing up without fail. So the poet Rumi has a similar saying, anything you do, if you do it completely, it will complete you. Can you elaborate on the completedness of Rumi in concurrence with Abhyasa of Patanjali? So I am not an expert on Rumi. <laughs> I do not know enough to comment about uh, his wonderful writings. But what I will say is that, yes, what we look at when we say Abhyasa and Vairagya is that Abhyasa is something that is complete in itself. It does not need the results for it to mean something. The actions themselves, the effort themselves mean something. That consistency of practice means something in itself. And when we build that consistency, it brings a lot of joy, it brings a lot of peace, it brings a lot of uh, steadiness within us. And uh, so this by itself is, um, I feel, a complete process. It's, it's something that is complete in itself, and you do not need anything more that you need to add to it. And so that is why Abhyasa and Vairagya are also paired together, that we do not need to constantly wait for results and wait for the fruits of our actions to come to us for it to then be complete. So that would be my understanding of it. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we have Priya Ji, who's uh, saying, thank you and which shloka, I think you mean mantra Priya Ji, because I don't think Vedas have shlokas was chanted at the beginning. I think she means the invocatory prayers. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, I chanted a couple of different things. The first one was a Ganapati mantra. We usually pray to Ganapati, like, uh, like, you know, in India, Ganapati is the first deity that we always pray to. He is the one who is a ruler of the obstacles. So we pray to him so that we are able to have whatever we are doing, it happens smoothly, it happens in the best way possible, and that he is with us while we are doing whatever it is that we need to do. So the first one was a Ganapati mantra. The second one was a Saraswati mantra. This one um, helps us to especially in chanting, this is something that's very important because Saraswati is the deity for knowledge, is the deity of learning. And so whenever we are learning anything, we cannot do that without first taking her blessing. So that was a Saraswati mantra, which was Prano Devi Saraswati. That was the second one. The third one that I chanted was a Guru mantra, Charanam Pavitram, which is, I think, particularly special today being Guru Purnima. Uh, but it's basically saying that I prostrate before my guru, I touch my guru's feet, and I pray for my guru to bless me with knowledge. So that is taking our guru's blessings and um, showing our respect to our guru. Uh, after that, uh, I chanted Sahana Vavatu. Sahana Vavatu is um, another Vedic mantra which is chanted in any kind of a teaching learning environment where it's a prayer that says please bless both the teacher and the student so that this learning process may happen seamlessly but there are no obstacles in this process of teaching and learning and after that i did chant a small little shloka which was yogena chittasya uh, this is just to seek the blessings of sage patanjali before we start any kind of a yogic practice so those were the things that i chanted right at the beginning Thank you. Um, I'm just going to combine all of Wendy's questions. She wants to know, how do you know the pace of a chant? Because she's heard uh, different paces. And is the ultimate goal of Vedic chanting to come to silence? Okay, really good question. And uh, yes, so when it comes to the pace, it completely depends on you. So when you're starting off, when you're very new to chanting, uh, Usually most people will chant very slowly because you're still getting familiar with the language. You're getting familiar with the rules of chanting. You're getting familiar with 
you know, how to pronounce certain syllables, uh, what the rhythm is like, all of these things. So initially your chanting would be slow, but as you practice, as you build up the practice, you can then build up the pace to something. Uh, so generally when we talk about the pace, we do not chant it so fast that you're not able to hear the details of the chant. You're, you should still be able to hear the words clearly. You should be able to hear the notes going up and down clearly. So clarity is never sacrificed just to chant fast. That is the idea. So with practice, you can uh, speed it up, but speed it up only to some extent where that clarity still remains. And uh, uh, when it comes to the second part of the question, yes, uh, we start off with uh, a loud practice uh, where we are chanting out loud, we are following all of these rules. But the eventual goal of all chanting is to be able to do a manasika japa, manasika chanting. And, and this is not an active process in the sense that you're not actively chanting the mantra, but you have done this for so long that at some point the mantra will sort of rise within you. And, you know, just to give an example, if you have been listening to some song over and over again, you know, we call it an earworm, right? After a point, even if you don't want to, it's just coming back to you over and over and over again, right? The same thing happens when we are chanting. So say you're doing a japa. So I chanted the Gayatri mantra, you're doing a Gayatri japa. And you do it over and over again, you do it 108 times. And then maybe you're doing something else and you'll mentally still be chanting that mantra sometimes. And that is a manasika chanting that we talk about. That is the silence that we're looking for where we don't have to act actively chant anything, actively do anything in the mantra kind of rises within. So that is the eventual goal of chanting. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to combine all the remaining questions here because we're running out of time. RJG is saying thank you. Uh, Priya, to answer your question, that's the part we're getting to next. So first of all, thank you everyone for attending the session and for the wonderful questions and also Purnima for the patience to answer them so beautifully. So anyone who would like to get in touch with Purnima for yoga classes, chanting classes, any more questions you might have, Kotiji will just share all of her details in the chat now, the website, Kotiji, her email, and also her Instagram handle, which is at Purna underscore yoga. There it is. It's in the chat box. So anyone who would like to get in touch with Purna, please do so through her website, through her email address, and you can follow her on Instagram as well. Um, I think just as uh, we answered most questions, uh, Jenny's saying thank you. One last question we're going to take are the terms chant and mantra interchangeable? What is the difference Wendy is asking? Uh, so mantra is something we specifically use. So chanting is, um, it's, a, it's a more generic term. We would use it for anything that can be chanted right and that can apply to something that you and i may have written and we want to chant it we can use that term but when we use the term mantra we specifically use it for text that is from one of the four vedas only those uh those texts are called mantras anything outside of the four vedas we do not use the word mantra for it although now it has become interchangeable with chant and shloka and all of these other terms but technically mantras are from the veda anything outside of it is shloka right so when we chant the bhagavad gita bhagavad gita has shlokas bhagavad gita does not have mantras <clears throat> when we talk about mantras we talk about chant that are in the Veda. So chant is a, it's a more generic term. It's more all encompassing. You can use it for pretty much everything that can be chanted. Whereas mantras would be something very specific to Veda. Thank you so much, Purnima. Um, that brings us to the end of this session. Thank you everyone again for joining us. And just to remind all of you again, you can always revisit this session 
uh, share it with people because we record our sessions and they're going to be available on the Indica Yoga YouTube channel as well as our social media channels and on our website. Um, thank you again, Purnima, for collaborating with Indica Yoga and for this beautiful session. And uh, I hope everyone joins us again because this is the start of the Veda Sampada sessions where we'll be focusing on chanting, on mantra, on Sanskrit. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And just to remind all of you on Wednesday, we have our next session of Ayur Ayush Talks. We'll be joined this week by Vaidya Prasad. So I hope I hope to see all of you again on Wednesday. Thank you so much. Namaste.